This LOS is calculate and interpret measures of central tendency, including the population mean, sample mean, arithmetic mean, weighted average or mean, geometric mean, harmonic mean, median, and mode. So you can see this is a little bit of a longer LOS. We've got 11 slides. Okay, first we're going to start with the arithmetic mean. The arithmetic mean is the sum of the observations divided by the number of observations, or sometimes we say the count. Uh, we can compute the arithmetic mean for both populations and samples, known as the population mean and the sample mean respectively. So you can see the formula is the same, it's just that in the first case we're dealing with the population which is all um, observations and we use the Greek symbol mu for that, okay? So it's the sum of the observations divided by the count of the observations or the number of observations. The sample mean is the arithmetic mean computed for a sample. Many times we cannot observe every member of a set, so we observe a subset or a sample of the population. So the sample average, and this is important, we often use the X bar. Uh, so we don't, we don't use mu is for the population mean, and X bar is for the sample mean. X bar is the uh, arithmetic mean value of a sample. The next thing that we're going to look at is the median. And the median is the value of the middle item of a set of items that has been sorted into ascending or descending order. In an odd number of uh, sample of n items, the median occupies the n plus one divided by two position. In an even numbered sample, we define the median as the mean values of the items occupying the n divided by two and n plus two divided by two positions, the two middle items, okay? So here's a little example, uh, makes the, you know, an example makes the understanding of the medium a lot easier. We have a, a number of uh, stocks here, Caterpillar, Ford Motor Company, General Dynamics. We have the co consensus current earnings per share, and we have the consensus current PE. So the PEs, we're gonna look at the median PE. We take the data and we reorder them in ascending order. So you can see the lowest PE is 10.97. The highest PE is 204.82. And then we can count how many observations do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have an odd number, okay? We have uh, seven. So the median, it occupies n plus one divided by two equals eight divided by two. So it's the fourth position. But well, we can see that very clearly here because what is the median doing? It's the middle position. So we have three to the left and we have three to the right. So in a small question, for example, on the exam, if they're giving you seven bits of data, if it's an odd number, it's very easy. Just write them out from left to right and you can just eyeball it that I've got three to the left and three to the right and the median is the middle position. So we don't even have to do the n plus one divided by two eight divided by two plus four, we can just see it. That's the middle position, it's the fourth one. The mode. The mode is the most frequently occurring value in a distribution. A distribution can have more than one mode or even no mode. When a distribution has one most frequently occurring value, the distribution is said to be unimodal. If a distribution has two most frequently occurring values, then it has two modes and we say it's bimodal. If the distribution has three most uh, frequently occurring values, it's trimodal. When all the values in the data set are different, so none are the same, the distribution has no mode because no value occurs more frequently than any other value. Stock return data and other data from continuous distributions may not have a modal outcome. When such data are grouped into intervals, however, we often find an interval, possibly more than one, with the highest frequency, the modal interval. So I already showed that modal interval on the histogram in the Ibbotson data. That was the 10 to 20 percent uh, S&P 500 return, uh, positive 10 percent to positive 20 percent, the modal interval. That was the most frequent uh, return, annual returns that we saw from 19. Uh, 26 on. 
Now we're getting into the weighted mean, which we call a weighted average, and it's where the sum of the weights equal one, okay? So the best way to understand the weighted average is just through an example. And we use that for uh, calculating portfolio returns. So again, this is a fast forward. We need it to calculate um, uh, portfolio expected returns. So the first asset, asset B, has an expected return of 5%, standard deviation of 8%. The next asset, S, has a higher expected return of 10% and a higher standard deviation of 20%. This is roughly the return in risk to large cap stocks and bonds from the Ibbotson data, by the way, in terms of returns and standard deviations. So the expected return of a portfolio is easy. It's just the weighted average. And how do we do that? If this uh, two asset portfolio was equally weighted, that means the weight of the bond was 50% and the weight of the stock were, uh, was uh, 50% then the weighted average would be 50% times 5%, that's the expected return on the bond, plus 50% times 10%, that's the expected return on the stock, and we'd have an expected return for the portfolio, a weighted average of 7.5%. The geometric mean. The geometric mean is most frequently used to average rates of change over time or to compute the growth rate of a variable. In investments, we frequently use the geometric mean to average a time series of rates of return on an asset or a portfolio or to compute the growth rate of a financial variable such as earnings or sales. Because of the effect of compounding, the geometric mean uh, return is always less than or equal to the arithmetic mean return unless there is no variation in returns, in which case they are equal. So that means anytime, if you're looking at annual stock returns and you've got a couple of years or months where there's negative returns, when you do the geometric mean, it's always going to be less than the arithmetic mean. Okay? A geometric mean provi uh, return provides a more accurate representation of the growth in a portfolio value over a given time period than does an arithmetic mean return. And I use the, an example uh, several times. Uh, in different LOSs. So the, the formula for when returns are annual is going to be uh, 1 plus uh, the return times 1 plus the return times 1 plus the return and uh, it's to the uh, n uh, square root to the n, okay? So we, we often see it like this, square root to the n, uh, number of years, or we can rewrite it that it's uh, uh, to 1 to the n to the power of one to the n, okay? That's just different uh, nomenclatures for the algebra. This is the, the example that I use in more than one place. Um, so when we're looking at the geometric return, when looking at historical returns on investments, we want to use the geometric averages. And this example again, which I do more than once uh, throughout the different LOSs, uh, this quick example will show you why. In this example, we start with 10,000 US dollar and we had the following returns for four years. Plus 10%, minus 25%, plus 21%, and plus 6%. So the arithmetic average is 3%. 10 minus 25 plus 21 plus 6 divided by 4 is going to give us 3%. So if we use that arithmetic average and we started with our 10,000 and we multiplied by 1.03 four times, we would get a total of 11,000 $255.08, but that's not what our actual balance would be. So let's do the math again. Uh, 10,000 times that first year 10% return, we're going to have 11,000 at the end of year one. 11,000 times negative 25%, we're going to have 82.50 at the end of year two. Then we've got a 21% return, so 82.50 times uh, 21% uh, for year three. At the end of year three, we're going to have a balance of 9982.5%. And then finally in the fourth year where we have a 6% return, we're going to have an ending balance of 10,581 and 45 uh, cents. And you can see that is less than uh, if we use the arithmetic return of 3% and it's con it's considerably less. So now let's calculate the geometric average using the uh, the the formula. So it'd be 1 plus 0.1% times 1 minus uh, 0.25 times 1 plus 0.21 uh, times 1.06 uh, 
to the power of uh, 1 over 4 minus 1 times 100. And what you're going to get is less than 3%. You're going to get a geometric average return of 1.42296%. Okay? So again, just using that very simple technique of t starting with your $10,000 and multiplying it by 1.0142296 four times, we're going to get the correct balance in the account at the end of the four years, which is the $10,581.45. That's the correct balance in the account after four years. Using the geometric average adjusts for the fact that after a negative year, there is less balance in the account on which to apply the following year's returns. It is important uh, to not use the arithmetic averages when looking at average annual investment rates of return. Okay, a quick little practice problem to check your knowledge. An analyst collects the following set of past stock returns, negative 2.3%, negative 5.1%, 7.6%, 8.2%, 9.1% and 9.8%. Which of the following measures of return is most likely the highest? Most likely the highest. The median return, the ge geometric mean return, or the arithmetic mean return? Okay, the correct answer here is A, it's the median return. And down here, I give you some notes very quickly though. Uh, the median is easy. There's uh, six values, so it's the average of spots three and four. Uh, calculating the arithmetic average is easy. So that's the comparison that you need to do because you can see there's two negative returns. So we know if there's negative returns, the geometric average must be less than the arithmetic average because there's negatives. So this is easy. There's just two quick calculations and we're done. So the median we're going to do, uh, we have to sort the data. And it's already been sorted for us, so that's nice. We didn't even have to resort. Look on the exam, they might give it in a jumbled order. So it's just going to be the 7.6% plus the 8.2% divided by 2 is going to give us 7.9%. And the arithmetic average is easy. It's just the sum of the numbers divided by the count of the numbers, which is 4.55%. And we can see that is lower than the median. So just look, they're asking which is most likely the highest. So the highest is A, it's the median return. Okay, we're on the last slide for this LOS and we're covering their har harmonic mean. And the best way to understand the harmonic mean is just to go through a quick example. So in this example, suppose an investor purchases a thousand euros of a security each month for two months. And the share price are 10 euros and 15 euros at the purchase dates. So here's the formula for the harmonic mean. In the numerator is two, the number of months, and the denominator, we're going to do one over 10, that's the, the share price uh, for, the, for the first purchase, plus one over 15, which is the share price for the second purchase, and that's gonna give us 12 euros, okay? So if you have troubles understanding uh, or remembering that formula for the harmonic mean, I think an easier way to do it and the way that I did it is just to remember that this is just a weighted average. You can use the weighted average formula. So let's go through it again using the weighted average. I just put it down here. I think this is a lot easier because you know you spent a thousand euros and the stock price was 10 euros in the first month. So you got a thousand shares. In the second month, it's the same thousand euros, but the stock price was 15 euros. So you got 66.67 shares. So your total was 166. 0.67 shares. So weighted average, I spent 2,000 euros divided by 166.67 euros. That gives me 11.99976, which is rounding to my 12 euros. So again, my advice is pick a method, stick to it. And I think in this case, the harmonic mean, don't be intimidated by trying to memorize another formula. Just remember that you can use the weighted average and you're going to come up with the same answer. So that's the last slide for this LOS. Thank you very much.